Hi. I'd like to talk to you today about electric flux and Gauss's law. First, let me define electric flux. Electric flux is the dot product of the electric field with the area vector. Now to back up a little bit, if you have some electric field line that are piercing through some kind of area, okay, here shown as a square and the electric field line shown as orange arrows, then what's happening there is that your electric field is perpendicular to the plane of your area. Now, we're going to talk about the area vector in just a second, but for now, just bear with me and assume that the electric field lines are piercing through perpendicular to that. We would multiply the electric field strength, which I'll call E, with the size of the area, A, and then that would be our electric flux. If you do some dimensional analysis on this, then the electric field has units of newtons per coulomb, and the SI units of area would be meters squared. So the units of flux are newton meters squared per coulomb. Okay, but what if your electric field isn't completely perpendicular to the plane of your surface, and instead it makes some angle with the surface? Okay, well, that's going to reduce the amount of flux. If you think of the extreme example, let's say that this is our electric field vector and my hand is the area. So this way it's perpendicular, we'll get the maximum amount of electric field lines piercing through that area, okay? However, if I turn my hand so that the plane is parallel to the electric field, well if my hand were infinitely thin, for example, which of course it's not, then no electric field would then pierce through the area. So there's got to be an angular dependence. The perpendicular to the plane, that'll be the maximum, right, flux, whereas if the electric field and the plane are parallel, then that will be zero flux. So there's an angular dependence in there. So the electric flux is proportional to the strength of the field, yes, but it's also proportional to the cosine of the angle theta. Now we define the angle theta as the angle in between the field and the perpendicular line or the surface normal from the plane. And then we say that the electric flux is equal to Ea cosine of theta, or to get back to my original definition, the dot product of the electric field with the area vector. Okay? So, like I said, the flux is a maximum when the surface is perpendicular to the field. So here's my surface and here's my field, and they're perpendicular to one another. The flux is zero when the surface is parallel to the field because you don't have any electric field lines penetrating through uh, a surface that's infinitely thin. If the field does vary over the surface, if the electric field strength isn't the same everywhere, then what you'd have to do is integrate over the surface. So you'd take little tiny squares, right, DAs, and then you would find the flux d phi for each one of those little squares and assume the electric field is constant over that little tiny dA square, and then you would integrate to find the total flux. Let's talk a little bit more about the area vector because it's something that some students find kind of confusing. We define the area vector as a vector that points perpendicular to the plane of the surface. Sometimes we indicate this in drawings with a little n hat for normal or perpendicular, and we draw it always perpendicular to the plane of the surface. Okay. Now, in some textbooks, you'll, si you'll find the area vector written as just an A with an arrow over the top to indicate that the area vector has a magnitude of the area of the surface, and then the direction is perpendicular. And sometimes, to emphasize that point even further, some textbooks will write A times N hat, where N hat is a unit vector for the surface normal, and A is the area of the surface. Okay. Now, for open surfaces like a plane, then you can have an area vector that points either way. So for example, I could have this be my area vector or that be my area vector. But if I close it up, then my area vector has to be pointing outward from the surface by convention. It's just an agreement we've all made, okay? So if you have a closed surface like a bottle or a sphere, something like that, the area vector is going to point perpendicular outwards. Okay. Let's talk about what the electric field um, or the electric flux would be like for closed surfaces. So we're just drawn here a closed surface with some random lumpy shape, 
okay? And we want to know what the net flux is through that surface. Well, since the um, electric field is likely to change directions over this closed surface as we've drawn it here, what we'd have to do is we'd have to draw the little squares like I talked about, the little tiny DAs. So instead of considering the surface as a whole, we would break that up into little tiny squares or DAs over the surface, and then we would have to sum up what the electric field vector is like dotted with that DA over the whole surface. Now if our DAs go to small enough, right, we take the limit as dA goes to zero, then we consider that um, summation to be instead an integral. And so our net flux would be the integral of E dot dA, and then we would integrate that over the surface. Now if you have a closed surface, and if you have the number of field lines entering as the same as the number exiting it, then your net flux is zero. This is because of that cosine theta term. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But you can also think about an analogy between electric fields and water. Let's say that you have a pipe and you have water flowing into one side of the pipe and flowing out on the other side of the pipe. There's no source or drain of water inside the pipe. You've got the same amount going in one side as coming out the other side. So the net flux is zero. Amount going in equals amount coming out, right? Net flux of zero. And it's the same way with closed surfaces and electric field lines. If you have the same number of electric field lines coming in on one side of the shape as you do exiting on the other side of the shape, you've not got a source or sink of electric field in there, and your net flux is zero. Now, let's assume that we have a closed surface, and we do have some kind of net flux. What then? Okay? So, here, there's this little arbitrary shape drawn yet again. Okay? But now we can see that we have a net flow of electric field outward. We can see that we have these electric field lines pointing outward all over the surface of the shape. Okay? Now, they point in different directions because it's a closed shape, so if it has to point outward everywhere, then it's going to be pointing this way over here and that way over there. Okay? But let's say, for the sake of argument, that at each point these electric field vectors are pointing out and they're pointing net outward. Okay? All right, here we have a situation where we have an unequal number of field lines leaving versus entering. So we do have a net flux. As long as the electric field lines are pointing net outward, right, most of them, if you count them all up, the number of field lines pointing outward are greater than the number pointing inward, then we have a positive flux. If the opposite were true and we had more field lines pointing in towards the surface than out of it, then our net flux would be negative, okay? Now, this is really similar to the idea of, say, a well, okay, or a drain. In that case, you do have, for a well, a net flux of water out. It acts as a source of water, right? So the flow is outward. For a drain, the water would come in and it would get sucked down. So there would be a net flow inward, okay? So the analogy to water is still there if it helps you. Now, we're going to use this idea of flux that we've developed and then figure out Gauss's law from that. Now, Carl Friedrich Gauss was a physicist that lived from 1777 to 1855. And he was the one to develop Gauss's law. Gauss's law is an expression of the general relationship between a net electric flux through a closed surface and the charge enclosed by that surface. Now, it's important to realize when you're doing Gauss's law type problems that this Gaussian surface is imaginary. It's all in your head. So there'll be some real surface, some real thing, a source of charge, maybe a conductor or whatever. That thing exists. Then you're going to draw a Gaussian surface to help mentally guide you through the problem. This one is imaginary. And it's important to keep those things separate, to keep those ideas separate. Remember, Gaussian surfaces don't have to be real surfaces. Gauss's law is one of the four fundamental equations in electricity and magnetism. Remember, we call these four fundamental equations Maxwell's equations because he's the one that took them, kind of lumped them all together, added in a displacement current, and then did a derivation to show that light was an electromagnetic wave. So we've lumped them all together in his honor, and we now call them Maxwell's equations. But Gauss came up with one of them. Okay, so let's talk our way through the logic that Gauss probably went through when he was constructing Gauss's law.
let's imagine that we have a positive point charge. This is a real thing, like a proton or something. And then we draw a spherical surface around it. This is imaginary. This is our Gaussian surface, okay? Now, we know that if we center our imaginary surface along with our little point charge there, that we know what the electric field is like on the surface of that. And that's because we know the formula for the electric field for a point charge. The magnitude of that is kq over r squared, where k is the Coulomb constant in SI units, 8.99 times 10 to the ninth Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared. Q is our charge, the magnitude of our charge in Coulombs. And r is the distance from the center of our point charge to the radius of our sphere, OK? So that's our formula for the electric field. Now, we could rewrite k, our Coulomb constant, in terms of the permittivity of free space. Remember that k is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, where epsilon naught, the permittivity, is 8.854 times 10 to the minus 12 Coulomb squared per Newton meter squared. So you can always rewrite things interchangeably between your Coulomb constant and your permittivity. So if we do that, if we rewrite that, then the electric field from our point charge is now q over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. Examining this, we can rearrange things a little bit, and we can group our 4 pi r squared together. And so then we'd have 1 over 4 pi r squared times q over epsilon naught. Now, the area of our little imaginary Gaussian surface, that's 4 pi r squared. So if you look at this and rearrange it, you call a equal to 4 pi r squared, then you can rewrite your equation as e times the area is equal to q over epsilon naught. But if you look at this, you can see that for our imaginary Gaussian surface, the electric field and the area vector are always going to be parallel to one another. They're always going to point radially outward. So they're parallel. So no cosine theta term, that goes to 1, right? So you can just say 1. So we have Ea, that's our flux, OK? And then that's equal to q over epsilon naught, where q is the charge enclosed by our imaginary Gaussian surface. This is Gauss's law. That's it. It was shown for a sphere and a point charge, but it turns out to be generally true. If you have that same point charge enclosed by random shapes as shown here, S1 is our sphere that we just talked about, but S2 and S3 are these weird lumpy shapes, then we can see graphically that the number of electric field lines that pierce through this area is the same for all these random lumpy shapes, right? So that's our flux, okay? Our flux is the field lines piercing through the area. And they all enclose the same amount of charge, Q. So this is a general truth, right? That the net flux through a closed surface is going to be proportional to the charge enclosed by that surface. And that's Gauss's law, okay? Now, if you're not enclosing a charge, then you're not going to have a net flux, okay? So that's pictured on our next slide. Here, we have a point charge, right? But it's sitting outside of a surface. So the net flux through that surface is zero. Also, you could look at that surface and see, hey, I'm not enclosing any charge here, so my net flux is zero. So that, that's also true for Gauss's law, OK? So if we're to write Gauss's law out in its full formal statement, then what we would say is that the net flux phi, the Greek letter phi is what we use for flux, is equal to the integral over the closed surface of the electric field dotted with dA. Now, that flux is going to be equal to 1 over epsilon naught times the sum of any charges that might be enclosed by that surface. Now, if you have a continuous charge distribution rather than a bunch of point charges, then your summation will go to the integral. So it'll be 1 over epsilon naught times the integral of rho dv, where dv is when you're integrating over the volume of your Gaussian surface or of your, of your charge distribution. Now, when you look at this, remember that E is the electric field vector at any point on the surface. It's the total electric field, though. So this may have contributions from inside and outside the surface. So the total electric field at that point dotted with dA. Another important thing is, although Gauss's law is always true, it's not always useful. 
okay? In another lecture, we showed ways to solve for the electric field for any point charge distribution, and sometimes that method will be the easier way to solve for the electric field. Sometimes Gauss's law, in other words, is a bigger pain in the butt than the original formalism that we've developed, okay? So Gauss's law should be used when there's symmetry, when there's a nice symmetry, and then you can use it to easily solve for the electric field for nice symmetric charge distributions. In other words, if the integral is going to be awful anyway, you may as well just go back to method one, which is to, re to directly integrate the little dqs over the surface, okay? Okay, so how do you apply Gauss's Law correctly? Well, you want to make sure that your imaginary Gauss's Law surface that you use to visualize your problem um, takes advantage of the symmetry of the situation, okay? So make sure that you also understand that your Gaussian surface is not necessarily a real thing. A lot of students get confused about that. They'll have some charge distribution and then they'll construct a Gaussian surface and they think that their charge distribution goes all the way out to the Gaussian surface even though it doesn't, okay? The Gaussian surface isn't the real thing. Whatever lump of charge you've got, that's your real thing. So try to choose a surface for your Gaussian surface that satisfies one of these conditions. First of all, the electric field can be argued by symmetry to be constant over your surface. This most often happens when you have uh, a nice symmetrical shape like a sphere or a cylinder or a line or a plane, things like that, okay? And then you can construct surfaces which match the geometry of what you're going to do. So for example, for a line charge or a cylinder charge, you would want to choose a Gaussian surface that is a cylinder, okay? But maybe bigger or smaller, depending on where you want to know what the electric field is. If you have a point charge or a sphere, then you want your Gaussian surface to also be spherical, okay? All right, so make sure that you match the symmetry. When you do this properly, the dot product of E dot dA can be a simple algebraic product. What will happen is your electric field vector should always either be completely parallel to the area vector or completely perpendicular to the area vector so that E dot dA is zero there anyway, all right? Also, if you can find one where the electric field is zero over a portion of the surface, then that makes the integration of E dot dA zero too, so that makes it easy. So if you can satisfy some of those conditions, then your problem will be easy. If you can't satisfy those conditions, if you have a really funny shaped object or something like that, maybe you're better off just going back and integrating kdq over r squared over your surface. All right, let's do one example. I'll do more in class, but I'll do one here. Let's assume that we have a spherically symmetric charge distribution. We have, for example, a sphere of radius a and it has a total charge Q that's uniformly distributed throughout its volume. Let's find the electric field everywhere. So by that I mean R greater than A, where you're outside the sphere, and also R less than A, where you're inside the sphere. So we'll find it for both of those places. Now, to indicate which is the Gaussian surface and which is the real surface here, in this picture, the real surface is the orange sphere, and that has a radius A. Our Gaussian surface, our imaginary mental construct, that's indicated by a dashed line here, okay? And in this picture, we're going to solve for r greater than a first. So you can see that the dashed line is greater, has a larger radius, than the orange sphere. Okay, let's get going. So our flux is the integral of e dot dA over that surface. Now, the surface that we're integrating over is our Gaussian surface because that's where we want to know the magnitude of the electric field. So we're going to do a surface integration for a closed sphere. We're going to use spherical coordinates. So our r squared is fixed. That doesn't vary in this integration. Okay, we're integrating over the surface of the sphere with radius r, so that's fixed. So what we're integrating over then is zero to pi sine theta d theta. We're integrating that um, times zero to two pi r squared d phi, where we're integrating with respect to phi there. The r is fixed. When we do that, we get er squared, that can pull out front because that's the constant, 
When we integrate the sine of theta, we get minus cosine theta, and then we evaluate that from zero to pi. And then when we get d phi, we integrate that, we get phi, and we evaluate that from zero to two pi. Plugging in uh, to the limits of the integration there, if you evaluate minus cosine theta from zero to pi, you get two, and if you evaluate phi from zero to two pi, you get two pi. So those two things multiply together to give us four pi, and then we already had the r squared e out front. So that's our net flux. Now this net flux, four pi r squared e, has to equal two, the charge enclosed by our Gaussian surface, Q inside, divided by epsilon naught, the permittivity of free space, 8.854 times 10 to the minus 12, okay, in SI units. So, since our Gaussian surface encloses all the charge, and we know that the total charge on that uh, shape is Q, big Q, then I can just write big Q for that, and then solve for the electric field. So to solve the electric field, I'm going to divide both sides by 4 pi r squared. So I get E is equal to big Q over 4 pi r squared epsilon naught. Now remember that 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught is our Coulomb constant, so if you'd rather write it that way, you can. E is equal to kq over r squared. So this is the same as the electric field for a point charge. In other words, spheres look like point charges when you get far enough away, which you probably could have guessed. All right, now here's something that you might not be able to guess. Let's find the electric field for when our radius is less than the radius of our real surface. So in other words, we're going to construct an imaginary Gaussian surface whose radius is r, and r is now less than a. And this will help us find the, the electric field inside of our, Gaussian, our, of our real surface. So our Gaussian surface is now smaller than our real surface. To exploit symmetry, we're still going to have our Gaussian surface and our real surface have the same origin, okay? So they're concentric spheres, really. That's indicated in our drawing. Here we see our dashed line indicating our imaginary Gaussian surface, and it's enclosed by the real surface, which is orange. Okay, now our integration of the flux is going to look the same. Okay. We're going to do our spherical coordinate integration over that surface, our Gaussian surface. We're going to get the same answer. That's 4 pi r squared e. That's our flux. Okay. So if you want to stare at that for a second, go ahead and pause the video and stare at it. Otherwise, I'm going to assume that you're good with it being the same and go on. What changes is the enclosed charge. See, if your Gaussian surface doesn't exceed or match your real surface, you're not enclosing all your charge. Okay you're only enclosing, uh, enclosing a portion of it. So we have to perform an integration to figure out how much charge we're really enclosing. So our enclosed charge Q inside over epsilon naught is going to equal to 1 over epsilon naught of rho dv. Well, I told you earlier that the um, charge is uniformly distributed throughout our volume. So how would we find that value? Well, I told you our total charge was big Q and it's a sphere with radius a. The volume of a sphere is 4 thirds times pi times the radius cubed. So here, rho would be equal to big Q over 4 thirds pi a cubed, okay? Since a is the radius of our sphere. Now, all of those things are constant, right? The distribution of the charge throughout the volume is a constant. So I can pull that out of my integral. So Q inside over epsilon naught is big Q over 4 thirds pi a cubed epsilon naught times the integral of dv. We're just integrating over the volume of our Gaussian surface. So since we're integrating over the volume of our Gaussian surface, we're going to use the differential for um, volume integration for spherical coordinates, which remember is r squared dr sine theta d theta dv. Okay? And then we're going to integrate that through the limits for our little Gaussian surface. So we're going to integrate r squared dr from 0 to r. We're going to integrate sine theta d theta from 0 to pi, and we're going to integrate d phi from 0 to 2 pi, corresponding to typical choices for spherical coordinate variables. All right, when we integrate r squared dr, we get 1 third r cubed if we evaluate the limit from the limit 0 to r. When we integrate sine of theta, we get minus cosine theta, which we then evaluate from 0 to pi, which gives us 2. And then when we integrate d phi, we get phi, Evaluated from the limit of 0 to 2 pi, we get 2 pi. So that gives us 
the value of our volume of an integration of, not surprisingly, the volume of our Gaussian surface, which is 4 thirds pi r cubed. So plugging all of that in, we get q inside over epsilon naught is big Q over 4 thirds pi a cubed epsilon naught times 4, th 4 thirds pi r cubed. Now there's some things that cancel in that. So we're going to set that equal to our flux, which is 4 pi r squared e, okay? Then we rearrange, we cancel out stuff that can be canceled, and we end up with an expression for our electric field that says E is equal to the total charge Q times R divided by 4 pi epsilon naught A cubed. So you can see that the Q over 4 pi epsilon naught A cubed, that's a constant. So what this means is that your electric field is proportional to R as long as you're inside the real surface. So as long as R is less than A, your electric field grows as R. If you plot that out, okay, if you plot the electric field strength E versus R, then you get uh, a linear growth all the way up to the radius of your true sphere, which is A. So you see a linear increase up to A, and then after that, it acts like a point charge, and the electric field strength decreases as 1 over R squared. Okay. So that's a simple example of how to apply Gauss's law. We'll do more examples in class, but until then, I hope it helped. Remember, you can pause me at any time and let me know if you have any questions.